Good morning. Let's uh, start the session as usual by going through everything that we have done very quickly. Uh, let me just set the lights. No. Okay. Did it dim the light? No. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Quickly going through everything that we have done, today we are going to kind of fill in the blanks. Everything that we need to know for the semester is done, so uh, everything is covered. Um, but we are going to go through stuff and look at some algorithms, go through some programming and see how things are done, kind of go deeper into the language. Uh, also, uh, regarding the quizzes, uh, you have seen the announcements. Every link that I send you, read that link before you do the quiz, okay? So literally go through every single line because many of those things I didn't talk about in class. You have to read it and get the, like, what is the code? Like, uh, anyways, go through it and you read it and then do the quiz that is the, exactly based on that. Um, and uh, for quizzes in lab that you're gonna do, you're gonna, as, as you saw, you're gonna write small pieces of code and everything is from the beginning of the semester till now. Whatever I talk about, I'll ask you to do a very small piece of code that uh, uh, you're gonna write. So it's, it's, and it, it, I'll give you approximately a minute to do e each of them. It's, it's not a big code. I'm just gonna ask you to write very small little thing. I want to see how you how you code, write code on your own. Uh, and as specified, at the end of the semester, probably we're going to drop the two lowest marks of your quizzes, something like that. So that covers missed quizzes and um, things like that. And uh, the project, you, you're doing it now. You're going to get small workshops too. That, again, focuses on certain things, very simple workshops based on what we do in class. So whatever you see that notes that I do in class, somehow to force you to study the notes in class, I'll give you a quiz, uh, uh, a three-day workshop again, that work looks exactly like what I've done in class. You just take a look at the notes in class and then you do the workshop. All right, so um, quickly going through what we have done, we talked about functions and pointers and we said instead of, uh, uh, for a function to return, to be able to uh, affect more values than one, a function by default, and that is the rule in C language. There is no way to alter it. A function can receive many values and can only return one value. That's all. There is no other way to go around it, okay? So um, to be able to normally be able to gain some outcome of a, of a function to manipulate some data and give you something back, all you can get is one value, and that's it. You cannot get two values out, it's impossible, okay? There are some ways around it. We can just play some tricks instead of, we know that we can, we can return one value out, that that value could be a complex value that holds five values inside, like a structure. So we, we learned how structures work and then we went through functions that return one structure and in that structure have five things in it. Therefore, has five things in it and therefore you, you return five things out very expensive thing to do because it has to send the entire structure out. So if you have five doubles in there, uh, five by eight, uh, 45 bytes are supposed to be sent out and that's lots of information being passed by a function. If you call that function a million times, your program's gonna be very slow. Then we uh, got into pointers and we said pointers are variables that hold data, hold address. So the value that pointer holds is address. So therefore, passing, we, I, I know that I can pass many values to a function. Those values could be addresses of variables outside of the function. So if I pass pointers into pointer values into function, in a function, I can locate where the values are outside of the function. And using target of and all the variable, all the actions that I can do with a pointer, I can manipulate data outside of the scope of the function, therefore uh, uh, simulate or assume that I'm returning many values out, but it's not returned. You're still returning one value out if you choose to, but by sending addresses of other things into a function, you can 
kind of using a remote control, you can change stuff outside of it. And this was uh, the last thing we talked about. And I, uh, it was the beginning of uh, all the functions and pointers. So as you see in this pointer to get the student number of mark, I want to get two things out of this function. Instead of returning a structure out, I'm passing the address of an integer and address of a double. And therefore, when the double and, a, and a, uh, the targets of those two addresses are changed, the value outside of the function is changed. Therefore, in main, when I'm passing mark and student number at line 12 and 13 to get student mark by address, so essentially I send two values inside the function and the two values are addresses. Therefore, putting value to the target of those addresses will change the mark and student number in the main. Therefore, the function can manipulate it. We did this in day one by using scanf, and we just blindly and complied to the rule that I have to put an ampersand beside the name of the variable in a, in a, in a scanf. We didn't know why, now we know. You actually, you're actually sending the address of the value to scanf, and scanf remotely puts the values it scans from the, key, from the console into those values, and that's how it reads. And that's that. And that's why we do not pass the addresses to printf because printf receives values, so we literally pass the values we want it to print. So that was the thing. And then uh, we talked about structures. We said, so instead of actually doing something like that, instead of actually having uh, several things being passed into a uh, to, a, uh, to a, a function, I can, as I return structures, to pass several things, I can pass structures by, uh, by address too. So we created, for example, a structure with many things in it, price, SKU, quantity, and name, and everything. So I have a structure that has several things in it. And I could use the old-fashioned way by sending the structure by value and return it by value if I want to, something like that. But that's lots of information in it. Right now, there are like uh, 30, uh, 31 bytes for the character and four bytes for quantity, four bytes for SKU and eight bytes for, for price. So it's a big package. Sending that by value into a function, even to print it, is expensive because it has to get copied. And we, we actually <coughs> uh, demonstrated that, th that such a thing actually triggers something like this. If you do not pass it by value, this is how, by address, this is how you pass it. So the function has to instantiate a structure and copy everything to it. Therefore, lots of information is passed, where when you, when you uh, pass it by address, you only pass four bytes or eight bytes, depending on what is your computer's address system, and it receives the address of where that ginormous amount of information is. Therefore, only eight bytes is passed, and you can manipulate that one. As easy as that. We did something like that, and uh, uh, after going through them, we understood that we can pass the addresses of, uh, of uh, uh, structures to a function to and, and manipulate a structure. So we don't have to pass so many different things to a, to a function. We can just pass the address of a structure and manipulate many things like that. Obviously, doing something like that we put all that to one part of organizing your code is to always, uh, when you are targeting something, in this case is an item that holds uh, information about, what was the information about? Price and SQ and quantity and the name of the item that we have in a store. When we have something like this and we are passing the entire thing into it, if I want to print the item, it's a good idea to make it constant, not to, by mistake, do something wrong. Like print item constant and print items, many of them constant. So the constant values on passing guarantees that it's not changed. So it's a good idea to always look at your logic of your function, and when you are passing an address to a function, see if the thing you are passing is supposed to change or not. If you are not supposed to change it, make sure to remind yourself of that by passing a read-only pointer. 
okay? A read only address, and therefore I put const for print and regular pointers for read, which means read can change the target of this pointer, uh, of this address, but print cannot change the target of this address. It can read it only. I'll be clear down to this point. Again, these are all reviews, and I'm going through everything so we can uh, kind of remember how things are done. One important point in programming is to always pack the information that are relative into each other into one module, not to get confused. So if I am creating an item dealing with stuff that I have in, a, uh, in, a, in an inventory, inventory system or something like that, uh, I put all those things in an item.h and an item.c. What happens is that I put the structure definition inside the header file so it can be used in any program that needs to use item. And I put the prototypes dealing with that item inside the header file. Therefore, it's organized. I know when I bring the item.h, I not only bring what an item is, but I also bring how can I work with an item using the functions relative to that fun, uh, item in here. And obviously, all the actions are put in a C file. So everything that these print items are supposed to do are actually kept inside the item.c. Important thing that we talked about was to never include a header file inside another header file. Another reminder, never include a header file inside another header file unless you have to, okay? There's always an exception. So for example, if I want to pass a file pointer, we're gonna come to it soon, to a function, obviously that file structure needs to be identified. Therefore, you need to include standard input output in the header file. But in this case, I'm not using anything in here. They are just plain C definitions. No need for any kind of uh, inclusions. Why we don't do that? Because if you start including stuff, what was include? Anybody can tell me? What is an include in, in, first of all, what is hashtag? Hashtag says, what does hashtag mean? It means compiler. It means you're talking to the compiler. You're asking compiler to do something before compilation. These are requests to set up your code. We know that the defined statement, the two things at the top and the bottom, we use blindly. We're gonna learn exactly how they work in detail in OP345, not even 244, okay? So the two thing at the top and the bottom, we call it compilation safeguards. Just put it over there, follow the rule that is Seneca underline name of the header file under, underline H. You put that one to create a unix. We don't talk about that, okay? But well, the file state that we know is a search, of, search and replace. So you're essentially telling to the compiler, I want to search for all max no of products and replace with 100. So it literally search and replaces. And when the compilation begins, there is no max number of products in the code anymore. They're all replaced with 100. So even if you are getting an error, it's going to be error on 100, not max number of products. Remember that. Because many times you see the cursor standing on a, on a defined statement and tells you some error that has nothing to do with that. If that's the case, go back and see what the define is. That's what you're getting the error for. So why we don't include, we don't want to do that? Two reasons. First of all, when you include a header file someplace, it's literally a copy and paste. So when you include an item in your header, in your uh, program, you're telling to the compiler, go get that file, copy the content, and paste it here. Literally. Okay? If you do that everywhere, and you keep including everything everywhere, you're going to end up having a source code that is thousands of lines code just for you because you want to print something. <laughs> That's too heavy. You don't want to have that much burden over a compiler. I know a compiler is going to look at all the things and say, ah, oh, it's too many times it's included. I'm just going to do it once and it's going to fix it. But in future, when you are, say, working on Office Libre, that's something like Microsoft Office, but it's an open source version of it. Compiling that thing, compiling it takes four hours. It has like five million lines of code. Now, if, you just, if they didn't follow that thing, then it could not be compiled because it's just so big that the compiler cannot go through it. So you have to be careful. These are things that you need to always follow at the moment, and in future, you're going to find out what the reason is. So back to the thing we said again, 
include only where needed, not just in case include. That's a bad thing to do. And in here, we don't have anything. But if I go to item.c, I see that over I need to include standard input output because of, I have all the, uh, all the printf's. I need to include utils.h because I used get int and stuff like that in here that I, that I put over there. I include item.h because I need to know what an item is. So all the things that are needed are included in here and not in the header file. And that's a perfect example of a beautiful module, a module that is uh, um, very nicely modularized, let's put it that way. It doesn't have anything extra, and it only has what it needs, and it encapsulates whatever you want about an item in one entity. And therefore, you include that entity, and everything for an item comes with it. Then we talked about the real syntax of printf and scanf. We said that printf and scanf, when you use it, they are literally input and, uh, uh, output and in input, uh, output and input uh, procedures that print stuff on a targeted device, whereby not putting anything in your printf you're essentially telling to the printf, I want to print that thing on standard output. And what is standard output? It's your terminal. And when you are doing scanf, you are literally saying f scanf from standard input, which is your console. It's your, it's your keyboard, OK? And that's the real syntax. So when you put f in front of it, you're essentially saying, I want to read from a file. Now, no, that file can be standard input or I'm going to write onto a file, and that file can be standard output. And these two files are always open and ready to work with. Unlike what you're eating right now, you don't have to open the cap of the thing to eat from it. OK? It is already open. All the other files that we're manually working on, you have to first take a cap off, which means open it, eat from it, and then after you're done, you close it so the flies will go in. <laughs> okay, so you have to open before, close after. That's the rule, right? But in uh, uh, standard input and standard output, because input and output is what your program does, automatically they are open when C program starts, and they get closed when C program ends, okay? Uh, so standard output is your terminal, monitor, whatever you call it. Standard input is your console or your keyboard where you type. So what we can do instead of actually printing on standard output, we can create a file. This file is a structure someplace defined in the, uh, in the in standard input output. And fopen creates one and sends its address out with, so it essentially looks for the file, is the file, opens the file, and puts all the specifications that they need inside the file. I was hoping that it shows the content so I can actually go through it and tell you what it is uh, inside my file in here, but it, oh, because it's not compiling, it's not showing. But anyway, you can actually see there are many different fields over there that uh, a little too rich for our blood, but it's nevertheless a structure. So what fopen does, it looks for the file the way you mention it. So it says, I want to open this file, and I want to open it for writing. All we need to do for this semester is write for write, w for write, and r for read. There are so many different ways you can open a file. You can open a file for write and read. You can open a file for read and write. You can open a file for uh, uh, read and append. You can open a file for append. So there are many different things, but for us, it's just reading and writing. We don't want to do anything fancy with it. Are we good? All right. So when you say open, it opens that file for that thing, and it builds a structure and returns the address of that structure out into my file. So my file holds all the information you need to be able to write into a file, like standard output. So instead of standard output, if you put in my file, it works the exact same way you print on a screen on a file. No difference. You are not learning anything new. It is exactly what you have done with printf. But instead of just temporarily showing it on a screen and be done, 
it permanently writes it in a file. That's all. No difference whatsoever. Okay? Everything formatting going to new line. Whatever you do, it happens in there. We good? It's not alternative. It's different places. It's like you're saying, can I drink from this cup or that bottle? They're two different things. The action of drinking is the same. I'm drinking from this or I'm drinking from that. That's your scanner. From where you are drinking, that's the first one. You are drinking from standard input. It means you are reading from keyboard. You are reading from hello.txt. It means you are reading from the file, not from the keyboard. So the action of reading Nothing new to learn. It's exactly the same. Where you are reading from is the new thing. So again, you're not learning anything new. Drinking is drinking. I'm just changing the cup. <laughs> Does that make sense? OK. OK. So that's that. So essentially, we said if I run this and I demonstrate it, when I run this, because it's open for writing, it will actually, if the file is not there, it will create hello.txt and put this message in it, and then it closes it and comes out. OK? And if the file hello.txt is there, it first wipes it out, overwrites it with a new file, and it does it. It's exactly like a variable. When you write something into a variable, if it has something and it gets wiped out, it's the same thing like that. Writing is like that. And reading, it opens the file for reading. If the file is not there, nothing is returned. It, it cannot open it. it. It will not create it because it wants to read it. So what's inside my file can tell you if the action is successful or not. It's a pointer. We know it when it's a pointer, the size of the pointer is it's the same for everything. The size of the pointer that points to a double and the size of a pointer that points to an integer and the size of a pointer that pointer points to a file, they are all same size. It's just the target is different, right? So if you look at the contents of my file, if that value is zero, it means it's pointing nowhere, which means the, the opening was unsuccessful. You can always check my file to see if it has content. If there is an address in it, it means the opening was successful. So that's how you do it. When you read a, want to read a file, you check the pointer. If it returned null, you've got to tell it could not open this file, and you quit the program. That's one of the beautiful things about working with files. You don't interact with the user. You just try to read it. If you're good, you're good. You're done. You do the process. If not, you just re return an error saying, hey, fix your file. Done. They have to go and fix your file. Same thing for the read, as I mentioned over there. So. We read from the file like that. Uh, we wrote so the hello thingy, and we read step by step. So every percent %s receives it uh, up to a, uh, a, bl a blank, a new line. Uh, sorry, a, a white space, and then stops. That was the rule for scanf. The exact same thing over here. Absolutely no difference. They're identical. OK, again, learning nothing new. <clears throat> And if I want to read a line from a file, I do the exact same thing that I did for the keyboard. If I want to read to the end of the file, I do it like that. We even created a flush file thingy. Nobody does that, but I did it just to show you that that's actually the case. So, so <clears throat> and, and, and we just put it like that. Um, I'll tell you the alternative. So Scanf does something cool that I need, that, and I'm going to tell you, talk about today. So that's that. So I'm just reading up to a new line, and I stop. Then I flush it, which means it's going to. Obviously, this flushing will not do anything other than just reading one <laughs> backslash and then throw it away. Think about it. Think about it for a second. Because I'm saying read up to new line and stop, right? So it reads and stops at new line. So there is one new line left over there. And I'm read, telling to the flush file, read everything up to new line. Uh, OK. You see it? So it's only reading one, but it works for everything. That's a good thing about that flush thingy. Uh, so if I uh, had an integer, I could use that one too. Anyways, it works exactly like scanf, no difference. Uh, going line by one to the end, what do I do? I use the scanf return statement. We know that scanf returns the number of successful field reads. So if I have 5% in a format specifier, it returns 5 if, if all 5 of them are read. 
and it returns four, four of them. Over here, I have only one. So if that read was successful, this returns one. If it doesn't, it means I'm at the end of the file. The file is finished. I can't read anymore. Easy breezy, right? So that's that. And then I close the file again. So that, that breaks everything in a file. Another thing I wanted to mention was that when you are printing, you put a, uh, a format specifier and then extra stuff that are not going to get replaced. It gets printed exactly. So it prints an integer in three spaces, dash x column, then prints a floating point, a double number in six spaces with two, uh, uh, with, uh, two decimal points, after, two digits after the decimal point, prints a comma, prints y column, then prints. So you write the placeholders and you put stuff that are filled and you do it. For scanf, what does it mean when you actually put something like that? Because it's reading, it doesn't make sense. You're not printing anything. So what is this thing for? You are telling to the scanf, read a floating point number and skip the comma after, which means scanf checks and sees if there is a comma after that floating point. If that floating point immediately doesn't have comma, scanf stops. It won't read anymore. So if this thing, if the file that I have is not comma separated, if the file that I have is not comma separated, as we gave an example like this, so it, as you see over here, everything is going like this, and I think I, at some place, see in here, the scanf is going to fail on this line. Everything, it's a floating point and a comma. When it comes over here, it reads the floating point, stops. Then it wants to match that comma to the character that comes next. It's not a comma. It only returns one because one was read. Therefore, you know something was wrong. And you can actually check. If scanf returns zero, it means it's end of the file. Okay, which means I couldn't read anything. Okay, uh, that's a lie, but let's say, let's put it that way. If scanf returns one, it means it's read half of it. So you can actually tell to the user by the value that scanf returns. If scanf returns exactly what it's supposed to read, you're good. If it returns nothing, you're at, you're at end of data. But if it returns partial stuff, then you can tell them that, hey, your file is as an incorrect data at this line. Go fix it, which we are doing. You know what N-U-L-L -L is? N-U-L, null, all capital. It's a, it's a value defined in uh, standard input-output header file, OK? Uh, actually, it's a null header file, and null header file is included in standard input-output. So when you do standard input-output, it brings null to. So it's literally set to 0, OK? So null is a defined statement for 0. There is another thing, there is another value that we have. It is called EOF, EOF. So if there is another defined statement, it's all capitalized, EOF. That means end of file. If scanf returns EOF, it means it's end of the file. So, so scanf has two different things that it can return. When I say scanf, I mean Scanf, F scanf, V scanf, all these things like the N scanf, all these things are different versions of scanf that you're going to face in future. When I say scanf, I mean any of them. Okay? So scanf returns EOF when it cannot read from the device anymore. Not because the data is incorrect, not because it couldn't read, because it hit the wall at the end. So if that happens, you can always check for that. So, so you can actually capture, instead of writing while and you put the scanf in here, you can actually capture the return value of f scanf and write the switch at the end to see why it ended. If the, what scanf returned was a value between uh, uh, one, if zero and, and one, if it was zero and one, it means you couldn't read the data. Scanf was successful, but couldn't read the data. But if scanf returns EOF, it means I'm at the end of the file. 
So those are the th so you can actually give proper messages. If scanf returns EOF, you're at the end of the data, everything is read. But if scanf returns anything else, it means the reading was not successful. Then you can actually tell to the user that the data was corrupted at a certain time and yada yada. Are we okay? All right. And I think that was the whole review of files and everything that we've done right after that one. So what we talked about last time in, in, in class, we talked about a menu system. We said any type of menu system that you have in the world, no matter what type of thing you have, console, GUI, whatever you have, the menu system always works like this, that you show a menu at the beginning of an endless loop, you get the value that menu returns to you. Based on the, what the menu, what that value is, you take the proper action, and then you go back to the beginning of the endless loop. And that's an endless thing that is happening over and over. And believe it or not, that happens in everything. Like, uh, I program remote control for our passes. Our passes remotely, remote control, uh, remotely controlled aircraft system thingy. But well, anyways, it's like the old remote control aircrafts that you fly, like the remote controls that you're actually doing and you're actually flying the airplane in the air with it. It's essentially an endless loop. It goes over and over and over. And while at every single loop, it's checking the controls to see what is supposed to be sent to the airplane. And it keeps doing that over and over. Everything is like that, okay? Anything that you work on is an endless loop. You can stop, you can decide to stop that endless loop saying, okay, stop, and that's usually in devices like that, like a remote control for a TV, it's an endless loop. It's waiting for the key presses. You press a key, it transmits something to the TV, change the channel, and then goes to the beginning of the loop again and waits for the next one. So every push that you do, you're essentially going through that endless loop. We have the same thing in a menu system. So in a menu system, how we design it is as follows. We simply have something that displays the menu, have something to get the selection from the user, and sometimes this get selection goes actually inside the menu. So this menu returns the, the user's choice. And then we put that one in a loop. We're gonna say while not done, so that done is when I want to stop the thing. So one of the options is to stop the whole system. That could be one of those options. If the, if the system is one of those systems that when it boots, it runs, then there is no end for the loop. If they want to stop the system, they have to turn it off, literally. And then when it comes back up again, it loads your program and it runs again, okay? So you start like this, you display the menu. After the menu is displayed, you get the selection. You switch on that selection based on what you want to do. And each case for that selection, does some task that is supposed to be done based on your program. In your workshop, it's going to be, I don't know, display the items or list the items or go to the point of sale or whatever. And then, and your point of sale may be another menu system. It doesn't matter. So they're all like that. And that's how the menu system works. Um, are we okay with this? We're good? Let's talk about strings and string header files to see what they are and how they work. Um, So to, to go through uh, what we have, kind of see what does it mean to go through uh, strings, I have to do a quick review of what strings are, okay, to see exactly what a string is. We understand what arrays were. So we actually looked at the arrays. Uh, 
a second. We said in the memory, when you create a variable, the variable occupies a piece of space and the compiler gives it a name, simulates a name for you. So when you say var is equal to something that you put value in. And we said when we create a pointer, still a variable is created, it's named, but the job of that variable is to point to another variable. And that's why we call it a pointer, because its job is to point. And what does an integer hold? An integer value. What does a pointer hold? An address. What is an address is essentially a positive value, right? That's what we said. So when we are talking about target of something, it actually puts the target uh, in and everything goes right after that. When you are creating an array, we said we, we are told that when you create an array, that many things are created in memory. So if I say integer AR5, I have five integers in memory and it's called AR. And AR0 becomes the first one, AR1 becomes the second one, AR2 becomes the third one, AR3 becomes the fourth one, and AR4 becomes the fifth. So, and as I mentioned, uh, the picture is incorrect. I'm missing a byte in there. Remember I told you that? So please keep that in mind that this is supposed to end at 128, okay, not 129. So I, sh I need to have another thing over here that actually, yeah. all right. So anyway, so it's five anyways. Uh, uh, well, what I'm saying is that behind the scene, and then uh, when you set values, it sets the values using those indexes uh, that you have, or indices. But what happened behind the scene really is that when you say integer AR5, it creates a constant integer pointer because it's an integer array. It creates a constant integer pointer. Then it allocates zero, a space for five integers back to back in memory that has absolutely no name. So those things are nameless chunk of memory that is exactly the size of five integers. And then puts the address of the beginning of those things in that constant, in that constant thing. Therefore, the whole address can be accessed through the, through the pointer. And that's how the pointers are, uh, the, uh, the arrays are designed behind the scene. And that's when you actually say target of one, two, three, four, five, it literally puts it over there and it's the same thing as putting AR0. So if I say AR0 is two, three, four, five, I am saying from the address 108 go zero bytes further. That is it, there. Then I say from the address AR go one integer further. One integer is size of how many? Four bytes, right? So it goes four bytes and it becomes the second one. In here I'm saying from AR go two bytes, two integers further. Two multiplied by four is eight. So it goes one, two, this becomes A2. And when you put the value in it, it actually sets the value to whatever it is. That's why you can actually write it like this. You can actually say target of AR plus two. And that's how pointers are different with integers. To an integer, if you add two, two will be added to it, right? If AR is 108 and I say two, it becomes 110 if it's an integer. With a pointer, it adds the size of the target of the pointer to it instead. So if I say AR2, it says, okay, what is the AR pointer of? Integer. What is the size of integer? Four. So I'm going to add two fours to it, which is eight. That's how pointer variables are different than integer variables. That's why they had to create a different type. Otherwise, they would have used unsigned integers. It's the same thing, right? So target of AR plus two, five, 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 it does the same thing and overrides that thing with five, five, five. Same thing. So that's essentially what pointers are. So, uh, sorry, arrays are. So how do we use this for, for, to our advantage to actually use strings? We know that strings are uh, representation of series of characters back to back. My name is Fardad, F-A-R-D-A-D. -D. There are six characters, so if I have an array of six characters, I can hold my name in it. Is that clear for everyone? 
The problem over here is that when I put my, the six things over here, we know that C is not aware of what is the length of an array. It doesn't know. You can't do it. And it's impossible to know what is the length of somebody's name. What is your name, sir? Gary. G-A-R-Y. Four. I'm Farda. F-A-R-D-A-D. You're four, right? You said Gary. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, so you're actually counting to see how many. Okay, so as you see, you don't even know how many characters your names are. So how we, how we can actually accommodate that? How we can actually fix that problem when we don't know what is the name, what is the length of information inside a character array? So what we have to do first, we have to think how big a name can be. And we imagine that number, then we kind of multiply it by two to make sure. So if I say the maximum length for a name is 15, right? So let's make it 30 to make sure, like, it, like in exceptions we can have that one. We'll waste lots of memory because of that. We're going to learn how to not to do that in OP244, but for now we have to. So what we do, we create our array. So we are going to have our arrays. And yet I apologize all, all the time for lack of artistic skills and because it's like a two-year-old trying to do something in the kindergarten when I actually write this. But hey. OK, so we have an array, OK? And that array of, of ours is actually uh, supposed to hold somebody's name. And I have bytes over here. And we know each byte holds a, a, um, a character. We know that for a fact, right? And our array, we know that we call this SDR, and that's going to point to that. So essentially, what I have done over here is this. I have written over here character STR. What is this? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I did this here. Are we OK with this? Everybody's OK with that? That's what I did. Now, if I want to put Gary in there, not Gary physically, just his name. If I want to do something like that, then this is what's going to happen. I'm going to put over here G, A, R, Y, correct? Now, how do I know that this is not Jonathan? How do I know where it ends to at Y? The mechanism that is created like that is to put an impossible ASCII code here. A is 92. That's the only thing that I remember. The rest of them, they have some positive numbers, right? The only impossible ASCII code for a character, and we all know these are not actually characters. These are numbers. We know that. The ASCII code of numbers are kept inside the character array. Character array is nothing but an integer array, but small integers that go up to 255 max. That's all. OK? So when I say G-A-R-Y ASCII code of G, ASCII code of A, ASCII code of R, and ASCII code of Y is going over there, how do I tell to other programmers that's the end of story? Don't go further. The rest is non-relevant. To put an impossible ASCII code over here, and that ASCII code is zero, backslash zero. So when I say backslash zero, I'm essentially conveying the message, this is not the character zero. Character zero has an ASCII code. It's a character that you can print, right? But zero by itself, either backslash zero, as my friend said over here, or I call it null. Null essentially conveys that this is an integer zero. And to identify that, usually when I draw it, I don't put zero over there. I do this. That's something that I got from electronics. You actually, when you do that, you're saying it's connected to Earth. It's nil. It is, so I do that. It means that's null. I stop. But what you have in there, as mentioned earlier, is actually backslash. So it's like this, backslash 0. That translates to null. There to say, OK? Translates to number 0. So essentially, if I want to make this thing to be a string, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, 
I have to do this. I have to say SDR. I'm so happy that your name is not like, you know, <laughs> sometimes you only have four of them. Okay, so, uh, so it, that's going to be G, right? And that's going to be one. That's going to be A. And two, that's going to be R. And three, that is going to be Y, correct? Now, how do I make this thing end? First of all, I scroll it up a little so it doesn't. I should say STR4 is set to, I'm going to put zero. The number zero, not the character zero. So when I put the number zero, that essentially means the same thing as, so I can either do this or I can do this. Or I can do this. No, not that, this. So these three lines, 10, 11, and 12, those are the ones. This is not. This is not null termination. Then his name is going to be Gary Zero. <laughs> okay, so that's not the zero that you see over there at line 10 is not null. It's a character zero. It has some ASCII code. So make sure that you don't do that. I'll remove it. So, so following this standard, following this standard, okay, means you are creating what we call a string. A string is nothing but a character array by following the standard and putting a null at the end. And all the functions written through that follow that. So if now I actually write over here printf percent s str and I say over here go to new line, what's going to get printed will be Gary, you're a famous person today, okay? So that's what's going to happen, right? And if I remove that null, then I don't know what's going to happen. Let's actually put it this way. Let me, uh, let me see what happens. You see? When I don't put that zero, it puts Gary over there and then starts printing until it hits zero. And how many characters did I use? 12? See, it's actually going into the memory. I have no idea what is after that. It keeps printing until by random. So if 5,000 characters later I had a zero in memory, that's where it would have stopped because the standard says that. Is that clear? So following that standard, now we can write many different functions to actually make things work in here, to be able to work with these things. Now we know for a fact that it's an impossibility to actually set one string to another. I can't do that. It is, and, and by the way, this is encoded, this zero thingy, all the process that I have done over here, all this process is encoded into this. So when you put double code, you are literally having a constant literal array. Okay? To prove it to you, I'm going to do this. Take a look. Put care. Oh. Hello. And in here, I'm going to put uh, two. You see that? Hello is an array that has H E L L. There, if I go and the, and it actually returns the address of the beginning. So if I put two, what happens? Zero, one, two. L will be printed. So that literal value is literally a, a nameless array that you give. It's like you are writing integer A is equal to two. 
Where that, what is that two? That two is an integer, right? That you cannot change. This is a string literal that you can't change. It's exactly that. It's an array somewhere in memory. It has no name. If I do that, it's going to actually print L. You will see that. You see? It's the same thing. And it's null terminated to follow the standard of string. Therefore, when I do it like that, it initializes it. The compiler, the standard is even embedded in the compiler. So the compiler knows when you do something like that. It has to set everything. So that, essentially, is equivalent to this. It's a translation into this. But without all the commas and, oh God, it's going to take a long time. That's what it is. So you're essentially saying, initialize that to G-A-R-Y. And actually, that zero is not necessary. Remember about initialization of the arrays? We said that if, you do, if it's smaller, the rest will be filled with zeros. That's what it is. So essentially, it puts these things, and then the rest will be zero. Are we OK? OK. So it's the same thing as that. So now that we know what strings are, Now we can actually write functions for it to be able to make our life easy. For example, string copy. So a str what was that? Okay. So string copy. So essentially, in here, what I'm doing, I'm saying start from the beginning. So I'm going to say there's a uh, string copy, and then the left one is destination. I'm not going to put a constant with it because I want to change the array. The right one I am copying from, so I'm going to put a const over there. Then I'm going to say, start from the beginning, go up to the point that the source has a value, not zero. So essentially, this is the professional way of writing that. That is kindergarten version. This is professional version, because everybody knows zero is false, and nothing but anything but zero is true. So it's going to go over there one by one. Put one character at a time, and when it ends because it stops at zero, it makes sure the destination is zero terminated to, and therefore that string copy. Now, if I want to compare two, if I want to compare two things, how do I do it? String compare. String compare because unlike, uh, like when you want to compare two strings, you want to see if they are identical or the first one comes first in dictionary, or the second one comes first in dictionary. How do we do that? This is how it's done. I'm going to return an integer to be a positive, zero, or negative. Then I'm going to say str compare. I want to compare these two things, right? So how do I do it? I'm going to say character constant, because I don't want to change anything, constant left character. and constant character right. So that's the left and right argument, right? Correct? Now I'm going to go through it one by one, OK? So I'm going to say uh, integer i, and I'm going to say 4, i set to 0. And I have to stop. I have to keep comparing character by character until I hit the end of any of these two, whichever comes first, correct? And that's easy. I can say. Keep going while I have left as not null and right as not null. So any of them becomes null, it stops. Are we OK with this? And I'll go I++. plus plus. Then in here, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say if, if left is not equal to right, that means I have to stop, right? That means I'm done. Done comparing, correct? So in here, I'm going to say 
integer i and integer done set to zero. In here, I'm going to say not done and. Okay? So, what is it going to do? This is what's going to happen. Where did I put that? Oh, here it is. This is what's going to happen. So I have, I have two arrays, right? I have two, two, two arrays. That's one. And this is another one. Are we okay with this? All right. Now, in here, I have something like this over here. Oh, it does. It's sorry. Okay. That's why I had this. So let me just clear all and do this. So this is the first one. And this is the second one. OK? Are we OK with this? So this one's going to be. Ah, A, B, C, and this is going to be A, A, B, C, right? When I start comparing these two, let me just stop this for a second. When I compare, when I go, when I go by the loop, I'll check. Are these the same? Continue the loop, right? Are these the same? No, stop. So when I stop, what happens is that left one is not equal to right one, correct? All I need to do is to return L1 minus R1. Correct? The ASCII code of B is one more than A, right? So therefore, this is going to return positive one which means this is greater than that. If this was A and this was B, then L1 minus R1 will be A minus B, which means B is bigger. It's going to be minus 1, correct? Or if it was C, it will be minus 2. The important thing is negative value. And what if they are identical? What if I have... A, B, C. Then it's going to go reach to the end and stop, right? Because it's at the end it stops, so therefore it's going to be 0, 1, 2. I have 0, 0, so it's going to be essentially two, uh, 3. And 3, and it's going to be 0, minus 0, and that is 0. Therefore, it's going to return 0 if they are identical. It's going to return a negative value if the second one is bigger than the first one. And, and so on and so forth. As easy as that. So, all I need to do over here is write over here, what do I write? I write, yeah, I'm just going to say return uh, left i uh, minus right i. And that's going to be the value that I return. Done. So that's string compare. It's written actually. So, and I have SDRN compare, which means you would put a third thing over here up to certain numbers. So we are counting the I. So SDRN compare or SDRN copy. SDRN copy says, SDRN copy says, go up to certain numbers. So it has a third value over here that says uh, integer len up to that length. So it's not only that, but also i should be less than len, and. As simple as that, OK? Uh, but the thing is that SDR len doesn't do uh, 0 at the end. So they have this thing over here. That, so they are saying, if i is less than len, 
then it null terminates. Okay? That's SDR. That's how, it, how they did it. So if it reaches to len, it's not going to null terminate. Why they did that? So you can change something inside something else. So if I have A, B, C, D, and I want to change A, B to X, X, then I don't want it to get null terminate. I just want to copy to the first hat part of it, not to null terminate. So, that, so anyways, so this is what it is. What I'm saying is that don't think that the libraries that you have and see are complex things. They are things that a first semester C programmer can understand what it is. It's just simply a loop and copying and things like that. But because it's so much used and it's a common standard in C, they put everything in string.c. So if you, sorry, string.h. So in, now, now I have these things over here. I can use my utils or instead, so in here I can actually, uh, let me just add those, uh, the, add the, the prototypes to utils.h. Okay, so now in here I can actually have character SDR2, 12. Okay, if I wanted to hold Gary inside the string, what should be the m m minimum size that can fit it? Instead of 12, what can I put over there? The minimum size that it can fit, huh? Five, amazing. Why? Because it needs a null at the end, remember. And that's why always they say you need to have a space for null termination. Please don't do that with double arrays. That's just dumb. Because double arrays are not strings. They're not null terminate. They're numbers. The only thing that null termination standards come for is the character array that is supposed to represent a string. So, so now what I can do over here is, that's interesting, okay. What I can do over here is, sorry, I had to put my phone on silence. So what I can do over here is to do this. I can say uh, SDR copy, that's my string copy, into SDR2, SDR. And now if I actually print the other one, We don't need this garbage. I've, I've looked at some of your repositories in, in, in MS1. Please don't spam with your, with your comments, OK? Put comments, I understand. But don't put story of your lives inside every line of code that you have. Small comments are good. Too much comment spams your code. Nobody can debug it, OK? So put comments in your code. But don't put too much, please. I just noticed that, and I just remember. So now, if I say over here, printf percent s and sdr2, first we'll run it, and then we'll see what happens. So if I run it right now, you'll see that they're both Gary. And uh, I can do that like this. I can say if, if, SDR compare of SDR, SDR, and SDR1 is equal to zero. Oh, CR, SDR2, yeah, SDR2. <laughs> then I'm printf uh, the two strings are the same. Okay, now if I run this because a string compare is returning zero because they're identical, that's what's going to happen. So it's as simple as that. So instead of using utils.h, I can actually remove that for now. So this is, uh, C strings, I'm going to call it, they call it C strings, C string uh, using utils. Okay, they call these 
We used to call this strings. Everybody would understand what a string is. But when C++ came through, it actually added a, uh, what we call it a compound type. Added a compound type called string. C++ has it. Since then, not to confuse the two, we call this a C string. So when I say C string, obviously we're in a C class. When I say string, it means C string. But remember and get used to that name. C string means null termination in characters. And yeah, so if I, if I, instead of doing that and using utils and all the good stuff, but as practice, I strongly suggest go through all the functions of string header file and start implementing it yourself in your own utils. And see, that's an amazing practice to work with arrays, characters, and essentially uh, empowering your logic. As you saw, they are very small functions to write. They're not difficult. Okay? <clears throat> so now in here, instead of that, I can say include string.h. And as you see, I I'm not capitalizing. It's not camel notation. So str copy, str compare. And it, it does the exact same thing. No difference. Okay, they're all there. So anything that you have in string header file is following the standard of null termination after the end of that kind of character array. That's it. Are we okay with this? The strings are done, okay? Now what string header file has, it's your job to go read it uh, in, the, in, that, uh, in here. String header file, you see that? Input, output, string header file. That's what it is. You click over there, it takes you uh, SDRLAN, SDR copy. Write SDRLAN without even using. How do you write SDRLAN? Write a loop until you hit the null, return the index. <laughs> right? As I said, it's so easy. Right? It's like all these things, like the SDR cat. SDR cat is, a, uh, is an interesting one. SDR cat is an SDR copy, but instead of from the beginning, it starts from the null termination of, this, of the destination. So it kind of attaches the two. So first you have to find out where is the null termination, and then from there you can copy. So write these things. Please don't look at what I have written, and write these things yourself in your own utils. You do that, and I guarantee you, you're going to have two weeks ahead of your thing even in OP244. Do this, okay? It's extremely important. Anyways, go through all these string header files and see what they do. Um, and again, remember, your quizzes, any quiz you're doing at home, I'm sending you a link for it. You've seen it, right? Any quiz you're doing over here, you're writing a piece of code from the beginning of IPC 144 till now. No announcement for it, nothing. If we have time, we'll do it. If we don't, we don't, okay? And I think you have only one left, right? How many labs do we have? I mean, if you have two, you're going to have two. If you have one, you have one. And at the end, we're going to drop the two lowest marks. So you know what is that? Well, that's, the, that's what we had in the in addendum, and I'm going to follow that. Uh, I don't know how many quizzes I'm going to give you. If, uh, it's ev uh, oh, and, and all the things that uh, I sent you the link for to study are all concept. There are no programming or anything in it. Okay, It's all concept. So you have to just read and understand what it is and do it, okay? And I'll give you around a minute to do each, each question. Uh, that's more than enough. If you read it and you know what it is, you can just answer it very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> uh, look at your announcements. You have two quizzes now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. You have surprises every time you're coming to the lab. There is no surprise. It's in the lab. Okay. The reason we didn't do it is because of the, me being sick, and uh, <laughs> so we had to. Otherwise, we would have. Uh, otherwise, after the midterm, that was what we talked about. We're going to do that. Okay. So that's that. Um, let's take a break and then come back and see if you have any questions. Then we're going to go a little bit more on. Uh, well, everything is covered till the end of the semester. Everything. Uh, just to, to to tell you before you leave. <clears throat> pointers we know, functions, arrays we know, structures and pointers we know, input and output we worked on, strings, I completely covered it right now, files, text files, records, we went through it, um, 
functions and arrays, we've done it till day, from day one. Structures and pointers, we have done it. And text file records, I'm gonna write a few codes for you so just to familiarize you a little more, but you have the basic idea for it to put two and two together, okay? As, but I'm gonna keep going for, uh, with examples. So you come back uh, after the break and we're gonna uh, write some sample code. Uh, first answering this question, when you read something and you wanna know if what's coming after is valid or not, you always use the scanf capability to read something that it can understand, and then you read one character further. That's the rule for it. At any moment, if you wanna know if something that comes next is valid or not. First of all, let me just do this and write D string header file, string h.c. So whenever you are trying to read something, if you wanna read a double, read a double. So, so I wanna read a double, um, double D, I'm gonna go scan F percent D, that's if I want, if it, if it is only infor, important for me if I can read something and I don't care what comes next. But if you are worried if some comes, if that's the only good information, if I want to get 22.25 and nothing after, then you have to see if there is nothing after. For that, you always read one single character after. So you always create over here something like character uh, next. And in here, you're gonna percent C, and you're gonna read the next. Because we know the data entry is buffered, which means when data is entered, when scanf fit is fit, oh, percent D, percent LF. When scanf is done scanning the double over here and stops, it means something came that could not be translated as a double, and that's why it stopped. And that thing is waiting to be read. So let's read it and see what comes next. If what comes next is the termination of data, you're good, you don't even need to flush because that's the end, which in our case is backslash n. In a comma separated thing, it's a comma, and then at the end of the record is a backslash n. In a tab separated, it's backslash tab. Depending on what terminates the data, that should be your termination sign. If that's not the termination sign, so two things over here happens. So essentially, and this is a pseudocode, it's not like it's a running program, I'm just telling you. So if ret is EOF, okay, that is end of file. end of data medium, whatever data medium is, okay? That doesn't happen with keyboard because keyboard is an unlimited number of data coming in through the thing. It just waits for the keys to be hit. So that's not gonna happen. But if you're reading from the file, so if that's an F scanf, then EOF is end of data, okay? When I say scanf, I mean any scanf, and you will see Family of scanf is vast. There are so many different scanf functions. Okay, if ret is not equal to two, uh, bad record. Because you had two percents over here, two, and I'm gonna say two is number of in format specifier. So if you have 2% signs, it's 2% signs, whatever. Like for example, I want, I want somebody to enter a money value. Then I, I, I expect them to enter 22.10 and a dollar sign after. If I want to do that, then I have to put a dollar sign in here, which means there must be a dollar sign after, okay? Otherwise it, it will stop. So if it's not two, which means these two weren't read, then the, it's a bad record. The format of the record is incorrect, okay? I'm gonna put else if, so you know only one of these things is happening, okay? 
So that's EOF. The other one, it says if it's not equal to 2, uh, that's 2 is the number of, uh, in, a, in format specifier. So what happens next? Now, if everything else is good, when I'm at this else part, it means scanf did not return EOF. It means scanf's number of reads is correct. It means it's read two things. Now I need to know if the two things are, are OK. So in here, I'm going to say else if next is not equal to. Define end of data. And I'm going to put over here backslash n. <laughs> OK? So if it's, ba if it's not equal to end of data, now that end of data could be anything. It could be a tab. It could be a new line. For our case, it's the end of the line. User hit enter. When you hit enter, that's backslash, and there is nothing else. It cannot be anything else. If it's not equal to end of data, then uh, uh, garbage after valid data. OK? And then after this, else, if uh, is valid, D. If not is valid D. The, the data is read, but it is invalid, which means the data that you want. So you have some kind of an is valid function that returns, checks the D, and says, OK, the double value that you, return, you say, it's supposed to be positive. It's supposed to be less than this value. So that's the validity of what you have. So the process of your data validation goes like this. First, is the medium readable? Two, did, I, did my scan have completed its task successfully? Three, did the data end successfully? Four, is what it successfully read is good? And then after this, Good to go. OK? And that's, that's the process of any foolproof read that you want to do that covers all the bases. OK? So in this scenario, I am reading. So this scenario, this scenario, this scenario reads a floating point or I'm going to read a real number, ended by dollar sign and nothing after. That's the scenario. Nothing after uh, and nothing after with, let's, let's do it like this in here. I'm going to say int, int is valid. Uh, Double D, and in here I'm going to say return D greater than 1.0 and D less than 99.99, whatever. Okay? With values, values between. 1.0 and 9999.99. You got your question for the quiz, by the way, my lady. That's the question. Write a read scenario that does that and that, and that's the answer for it. OK? For example, that could be a good question for a, for a, for a, for a final, final exam, for a final assessment. OK? So I'm going to say, write a function. Uh, so this main could be a function that does this, that returns, so receives a double pointer and returns integer as success. OK? This, oh, let's actually do it. I'll, I'll do it right now. OK? So in here, I'm going to say double value. No, I'm going to say double VPTR. 
okay? And int is success, that it's returning. So in here, I'm going to say int success is equal to 1. It means it's successful. And in here, I'm going to say success is 0. Success is 0. Success is 0. Success, so many ways to go, things to go wrong, right? Success is 0 and else good to go and return success. Success, okay. And in here, I'm going to say uh, VPTR. That's it. Now, this is a function, and in here, I'm going to say, Read uh, my double. Double. Is, is it okay? It's okay, right? Line 24. Oh, yeah. So that's target of the PTR. Right? Okay. There we go. So that function now. This scenario reads a real number ended by a dollar sign, nothing else after, with values between yada, yada, yada. Now, what I need to do over here is this. In here, that's EOF. I didn't read anything, so I'm not going to do anything. In here, uh, it's a bad record, right? So I have to flush. Flush uh, medium. Okay? Flush key, whatever you are doing. In here, garbage after that, are definitely flush medium. In here, you don't need to flush the medium because it read the thing. Why is it giving me that? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. So in here, Reading was successful. It's the data that is invalid. So there is no need for flushing. And in here, it's good to go. There is no need for flushing. So now it's a perfect thing that does a validated entry for you and returns true or false for you. OK? And there are many ways of writing this. Like, I can, I can actually do something like this. I can say, I, there is no reason for you to return true or false. For example, string compare, how does it convey the message? If it's negative, it's less. If it's zero, it's equal. If it's positive, it's more, right? You can do the same thing over here. You can say if it's zero, it means no error. If it's one, it means end of file. If it's two, it means bad thing. If it's three, so you can send different types of messages with this and, and do whatever you want to do with it. And that makes a foolproof entry. Again, scanf is from anything any family of scanf functions, f scanf, p scanf, s scanf, anything that you have. And you can actually go check all those things, OK? We have actually scanf that reads from a string. So you can actually write s scanf, and the first one is a c string. So you can actually read format it from a c string. <laughs> so it's, there you can do it. There are so many different things. So you learn one of them, you learn all of them. It's just the medium. What is the medium that, that you're dealing with? Uh, questions down to this point? Okay, that's, that's a very good question. In a string, can I use numbers? If you are using numbers as things that are not numbers, like I'm saying John 1 and John 2. John 1, do we have anybody else called Gary here? <laughs> You do? Very good. Gary 1, Gary 2, right? It's not an array. I'm just adding a 1 at the end of y and add a 2 at the end of y over there. This 1 and 2 are not integer numbers. They are characters. I don't want to process them. I want to read them like A, B, C, D. So for that, yes, you can read numbers in strings. But it's just a character. It's not something to evaluate to the value 1 and add 1 to it or add 10 to it. Fun? 
But if you want to have a if you want to have a number to process it in, then you have to put it in a variable in a variable type that corresponds to that. If you want to be number of things, it should be in an integer. If you want to be distance, precise distance between two points, it should be a double value. Right? Okay, so that's that. So that was actually a very important question. That's the difference between types of data that is extremely important. Okay? So bear that in mind. That's why I say the character zero and the number zero are two different beasts, F two different things completely. Are we good? Okay, the next day you are coming in, uh, you're going to have a lab, and you, by that time, MS1 is due, and you're going to have MS2 coming in. So we're going to talk a little bit about MS2, and uh, I'm going to post another small workshop, three-day workshop, very brief. On, probably I'm going to ask you to write something like this, okay? Very simple thing like this, and I'm going to specify what the function is supposed to do, and I want you to see, I want to see if you can do it or not, okay? Uh, Questions? Are we good? All right. So have yourself a beautiful day, and I'm going to run to my OP244 class. <laughs>